Mike, check. Mike, Mike, check, check, check. So if I sign here, it's not capturing your head. Well, that's not good. Um, can the camera be you, tilted you, up? Pan tilt? No. No, they're locked. They're they're pre programmed. So you, actually, if you want to try standing in, inside the horseshoe, I don't know if that's I do when Sharon or if you need. Okay, I can do whatever. Okay, so I can certainly try. So I'm trying to just go. You'll be in your normal spot. Um, right here. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, you're going to be there as well? Because if we do that, then it's kind of the mess up because I might be able to fall. Since I'm, um, I'm yes. the only, by the way. Yes. Um, <laughs> but I'm deaf and hard of hearing and civil rights. Could you kind of just sit here the whole time? Yes. So when he, if he's up here signing, mm -hmm. he's going to have to move like up here Wait. because he's taller. Uh, no, the other way. I think the other way oh, probably. No, sorry, the other way. You'll have to move back yeah. so that. Okay. So we want to capture basically from navel to. Yeah, pretty right. much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, if, when you go in there, yeah. um, I mean, we can see You can adjust them. You see, let you me know, just, we, we don't just look to us. Let me just truck. Top of the head. Top of the head. To the belly button. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that will help. Lay out. Okay. Well, that was pretty good. No, that was pretty good. Okay. Good piece of work. Sure. Hello. So pretty much always keep this one on. Is there a way to get there? So how do you pronounce your last name? Kamara. 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 Yeah. Okay.
question. I'll just ask it. I know how to handle this first. Yep, and then civil rights. Um, those are both mine, so this is time I know, and then I'm not sure about the, the other two. Okay, cool. I, I think Madeline might be going after my school. I'm going to stop whenever you say that. You like stuff more time. Yeah, I think, um, I think we've got to figure that out. But um, we're going to need to start here. I'm very short of it because I'm almost down the road. I'm almost on 90. You're taking me with you, aren't you? I'm not sure yet. <laughs> let, me, let me please take me with you. You ready? Yes, ma'am. No problem at all. I uh, just wanted to call this meeting of the Health and Human Services Subcommittee to order. Uh, we will have four um, agencies on the report today. Uh, we'll have the Maryland Commission of Civil Rights. We'll have the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. We'll have state archives, and we'll also have the Secretary of State First, we'll hear from the Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing, um, and I'd like to uh, signal over to Ms. Naomi Kamaro. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name's Naomi Kamaro. I'm here with DLS. I'm going to first be presenting the Fiscal 24 Allowance for the Governor's Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing. The Governor's Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing promotes the general welfare of deaf and hard of hearing individuals in the state of Maryland. Uh, the office works with state agencies and private entities to ensure that the services they provide are accessible to deaf and hard of hearing individuals in the state. On the first page, you can see the operating budget summary. The fiscal 24 allowance increases the office's budget by 2.4% to $531,000, and the entirety of the budget is made up of general funds. The allowance is split up, as you can see in Exhibit 1, as so. Most of the funding is allocated to personnel, with about 10% of the budget going toward American Sign Language or ASL interpretation services, which the office uses internally for meetings um, and externally with engagements with the public. This next exhibit shows the line item changes in the budget between the working appropriation and the 24 um, allowance. The biggest change is related to personnel, including the annualization of the 4.5% cost of living adjustment that was issued in November 2022. I'm now going to turn to um, the first issue that DLS wanted to raise with the committee, which is the issue of fraudulent or underqualified ASL interpreters in Maryland. The Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing reports receiving hundreds of complaints of fraudulent ASL interpretation every year. Um, and this has been an issue that it's brought up to the committee in prior sessions as well. So the 2020 Joint Chairman's Report requested um, that the office provide a suite of policy options to address this issue. Those policy options included um, establishing a state licensing board for interpreters, um, requiring the office to regulate interpreters, developing a quality assurance program so that interpreters could identify where they um, have room for improvement, and then also establishing a right to action for consumers of, of interpretation services. 
More recently, the 2022 Joint Chairman's Report requested that the office provide a cost estimate to set up a Maryland-specific certification board. There are two certification boards already in the country that are pretty widely used in other jurisdictions. And the office estimated that it would cost about a million dollars in startup funding to create such a program and then about half a million um, to sustain the program each year. Because that's pretty cost prohibitive, the office recommended against setting up a Maryland specific program um, and instead recommends referring to the policy options that it outlined in its 2020 response. As a result, um, on page eight is where we have outlined um, the recommended actions for the committee to take, which is to adopt a uh, committee narrative requesting a cost estimate for those policy options that the office introduced in 2020. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Seeing no questions from any of the committee members, I just want to say thank you again, Ms. Kamara, for the excellent report. And we'll bring up the agency head, Mr. Alvin Gilbert, Gillard, and his team. Director Kelly Brick. Hello. Good, good morning. I'm Kelly Brick. I am the director of the Governor's Office for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. It's always a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the analyst, uh, Ms. Kamara, for her analysis, her thorough report, and her recommendation that you adopt the Governor's proposal budget for our office. Our office uh, focuses on policy access for the entire state of uh, Maryland. We've done many different services over the last year. I'll just touch on a couple. Um, I did include those in uh, my report that's in front of you already. We also coordinate interpreting services. For example, so you see the other day, uh, the last Wednesday, the state of the state addressed by Governor Moore. Um, we coordinated that, the uh, CDI that was right next to that, and we coordinate all the pre-arrangements as well, interpreting. So lastly, um, we, in our written report, it does say that we will be providing a cost estimate for uh, different possible ways to address the interpreting licensure. And uh, so just to understand, so if you pass um, the SB 246, 346, um, we would not do any further cost analysis. Um, the rest there, is just, we can just go do the different options because we've already sum submitted our funding note for that bill. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. I, again, I want to thank you so much for your, con your continuous support for the ODHH and their services point, uh, to 1.2 million deaf and hard of hearing Marylanders. Thank you, uh, committee. Is there any questions for the, com for the um, committee, the agency? Uh -huh. Seeing no questions, uh, Director Brick, just want to say thank you for your leadership and thank you for everything that you're doing for our great state of Maryland. Oh, and just one more thing. I'm sorry. I just want to uh, add a very important, I, I mean to cut you off. It's important to recognize, I want our, to recognize our staff and our team that we have. We have Kate Green. Uh, she's our policy manager. And then we have Sh Shamika Littles who is um, the Chief of Financial Operations for the Governor's Coordinating Offices. And, and we also have Payala Sharm Sharmacharyar, and, and uh, she's our Policy Communication Manager. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity, and I, rec I wanted to recognize my staff, and I could not do this work without them. Thank you. It sounds like Senator Jennings may have a question. Thank you. And, and this goes to the recommendation regarding the uh, uh, fraudulent interpreters. And I remember the, the horrible thing that happened uh, during um, the president of South Africa's funeral. And, you know, never thought something like that would happen. Do, do interpreters have to be regulated? In, I guess my question is, and this is new to me, are they regulated in the state at all now? Are they licensed? begin with or no okay yeah thank you so much for your question 
Um, Maryland is one of only two states all over the United States that has no regulation framework for sign language interpreters. We often do get complaints of false, of fraudulent interpreting all over the state of Maryland. You have a, a perfect example of the South African uh, incident. That happens every day in the state of Maryland. And so we have to assess, we insist that we have to address that immediately. Um, and let me give you a quick example. So people go to a doctor and they find an interpreter that may not know uh, sign language, may be fraudulent, doesn't know ASL, and they may get m fault, bad medical uh, medication, they may go to a job interview and they may lose a job opportunity because of the interpreting. Yes, this is this happens every day. So, with this regulation, will they be able to contact your office and get a, a list of approved interpreters? Is that kind of the idea where people will be able to apply or not apply, but you guys would be the sound the place to go to, to find qualified? Right, so as of now, we don't have a process in place. Um, there's no state regulation or rules, um, so that's what we've, I've been asking this for a long time. Um, I, would, I do refer them to a public list of registered interpreters for the deaf. Um, they have a public list of certified interpreters. Um, right now, so oh, um, SB uh, 346 um, it develops a good framework for that, and so I'm happy to uh, discuss it further with you. Um, that would set up a licensing board within our office and addresses uh, many of those complaints that we get on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. And thank you. S Senator Jennings, I just want to say it is work legislation working its way through the chamber to address just the issue that you will bring it up and we'll make sure that you get the um, sponsor and the bill number from that standpoint. Uh, Director Brick, I'm gonna try this again. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership and everything that you do for our great state of Maryland. Thank you. At this time, colleagues, we're going to hear from the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights, and we're going to bring up Ms. Camaro again for the agency report, for the analysis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If you'll bear with me just a minute while I bring this up. So again, I'm Naomi Camaro. Um, I'm going to be presenting the Fiscal 24 Allowance for the Maryland Commission on civil rights. I'm not sure if that's, do I need to, okay. So the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights um, investigates and resolves claims of civil rights violations related to empl employment, housing, and public accommodation in Maryland. Um, it has work sharing agreements with um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to address uh, claims related to employment and housing. On this first page, you can see a summary of their budget. The fiscal 24 allowance increases the commission's budget by 0.9% to a total of $4.3 million. Most of that funding is in general funds, but again, there is some federal funding from HUD and EEOC uh, for the employment and housing related cases. Exhibit one shows how the allowance is broken up. Most of the funding is going toward personnel, which is largely the investigative staff processing cases. And then in the line item budget change, you can see even though the net change is less than 1%, uh, there are some increases related to personnel, including again the annualization of the 4.5% COLA. This is offset a bit by um, the extermination of special funds um, that was allocated in fiscal 23 for upfront costs to the gala that was held in August. So the only issue that I'm going to bring up today relates to the backlog of cases that the commission has been carrying. Um, the commission receives about 2,000 inquiries and complaints each year. This is on top of the um, backlog of cases that they hold. And the 2022 joint chairman's report requested an update on the backlog and open cases. In response, the commission reported that as of October 2022, there were 273 unassigned cases, 235 open cases, and um, more than half of these, 59%, have remained unresolved for over a year. So this brings me to exhibit four on the following page, which looks at the average number of days it takes to process each case. So you can see here um, the cases are broken out by type, again, employment, housing, and public accommodation. And those horizontal lines represent thresholds that are set, uh, the housing is set by HUD, and the um, public accommodations and employment threshold are set by EEOC and internally by MCCR, respectively. 
Um, the average number of days it takes the commission to process each case does surpass each of these benchmarks. But I do want to note that the commission has taken various steps to address the backlog, including streamlining their processors, processes for investigators. Um, and so part of the rise in average number of days to process a case could be in part due to um, clearing the backlog and bringing on new cases. Uh, so the, this is on page eight. Page seven starts the discussion um, of some barriers that the commission has brought up um, to addressing the backlog. One of them is around having sufficient number of authorized positions. The commission estimates needing 10 to 12 additional authorized positions to clear the backlog. And then a second issue that the commission has brought up is its inability to offer competitive pay for investigative um, positions. So exhibit five has two charts. This one is for entry level investigator positions, comparing the salary bans offered by MCCR and neighboring jurisdictions in addition to those two federal agencies with whom the commission has work sharing agreements. And then the second chart compares um, managerial level investigator positions. So you can see from both charts that the salary bans offered by the commission are below uh, salary bans of, of similar jurisdictions. So in conclusion, um, there are two recommendations that DLS is proposing to the committee. The first is to adopt committee narrative requesting an update on the commission's uh, recruitment and retention efforts, including more information on why people are leaving their positions. And then the second is um, to provide another update on the, the backlog and open cases. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Camaro. Is there any questions? Are there any questions from the committee to the analysts? Seeing none at this moment, I'd like to bring up Mr. Alvin Gilliard, the Executive Director of the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights and his team. Yes, sir. Floor is yours. Let me begin by saying good morning, Chairman McRae and members of the subcommittee, and let me thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for your excitement and enthusiasm and wanting to get us up uh, quicker than uh, we actually were scheduled. We appreciate that. Uh, but we do want to thank all of you for this opportunity to respond to the Department of Legislative Services fiscal year 2024 budget analysis. We would like to thank our assigned analyst, Naomi Kimura, for her analysis and her willingness to engage and learn who we are as an agency on this, her first budget process with the state of Maryland. I'm joined by our Deputy Director, Cleveland Horton, and also our Assistant Director uh, for Administration, Martine Cherry. As our written testimony indicates, we continue to work with the Office of Personnel Services and Benefits toward addressing structural issues which have impacted staff stability. However, our major challenge continues to be not being able to immediately assign new complaints into investigation status and to investigate them in a timely manner. The number of cases we have in our overall inventory remains constant because the number of complaints closed monthly is offset by the number of complaints filed monthly, either directly with us or through cases that are or will be transferred to us by our federal partner. Yet, even with these challenges, we continue to make progress in reducing the number of cases we have in unassigned status. That number has been reduced from a high of 567 cases as of June 2021 down to 273 cases as of October 2022 to 180 cases as of today, an almost 70% reduction in the number of unassigned cases. While the incredibly professional and committed staff of the Maryland Commission on Civil Rights continues to work to drive that number down. We continue to be challenged with the reality of, at some point, 
of simply not being able to drive that number down and keep pace with cases filed. That notwithstanding, we respectfully request the subcommittee support of the governor's FY 2024 allowance. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, are there any questions from any members <coughs> on the committee? Uh, seeing none at this moment, just wanted to say, uh, Director um, Gilly, just thank you for your uh, leadership. Thank you to your team, um, and thank you for the work that you do on behalf of the state of Maryland. Colleagues, at this time, I'm going to call up our third uh, agency, um, and that's the Secretary of State, and we'll have our budget analyst, Ms. Madeline Miller, um, deliver that agency report. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, my name is Madeline, and today I'm presenting the budget analysis for the Office of the Secretary of State. The office's budget increases by about $268,000 in fiscal 24 to $4.4 million. Uh, before explaining the fiscal 24 budget, I wanted to bring your attention to some actions occurring um, in the fiscal 22 and 23 budgets. Um, in the past, the office used reimbursable funds from the Governor's Office of Crime Prevention, Youth, and Victim Services to support the Address Confidentiality Program. Um, this program serves survivors of domestic abuse and other crimes by providing a mail forwarding service. Reimbursable funds from GOCPYVS uh, were replaced with um, ARPA funds, federal ARPA funds in fiscal 22 and are replaced with general funds in both the fiscal 23 and fiscal 2024 budgets. Two of the three proposed deficiencies um, make it so that a position that supports the address confidentiality program is funded with general funds. The third deficiency provides general fund support to the office's sales of publications, binders, and data special fund. Moving on to fiscal 24, this pie chart in exhibit one um, shows that approximately 87% of the allowance goes towards regular contractual personnel costs. The remaining 13% includes cost allocations, including one for do it, contractual services, and other costs. Uh, this exhibit on page four uh, shows how the budget has changed as compared with the previous year. Most of the change occurs within the office's personnel expenses in the top half of the graph or of the table. Um, then the allowance also includes the addition of one administrator officer position in the charitable enforcement division, um, as well as one additional contractual position. Funding for positions also increases due to the annualization of the 4.5% COLA from November. Then the budget also grows by $33,000 for software, other IT, and the do-it services allocation. The IT funding that appears in the office's budget is critical to its duties, particularly as it relates to the notary database and application system replacements, the charities database, and the new electronic filing system, or ELF. The notary database and application system needed to be replaced to handle requirements set by Chapter 407 of 2019 and Chapter 157 of 2020. Replacement of the charities database, which was completed in early fiscal 23, um, helped to resolve two findings of an OLA audit published on June 1st, 2022. The list of findings for that audit can be found in Appendix 1 of this analysis document. Um, and the replacement of ELF is critical to the state's regulation promulgation process, which is handled by the Secretary of State's Division of State Documents. ELF is the online interface that agencies use to electronically file regulations. Agencies submit their proposed regulations, including emergency regulations, to DSD via ELF. 
um, and proposed regulations are then reviewed by the Joint Administrative, Executive, and Legislative Review Committee prior to their publication in the Maryland Register. This graph in Exhibit 3 provides the number of proposed regulations and emergency regulations submitted to DSD via ELF since 2018. And you'll see that emergency regulations were a bit higher um, during the pandemic than they had been previously. The replacement of the legacy ELF system was initially meant to be completed by the end of January 2022. Um, and this end date was pushed back until September and then again until November. Um, this is also during September, ELF also briefly went offline um, in order to facilitate the system upgrade. And the Department of State documents initially had asked that agencies uh, refrain from submitting their regulations during that time. Uh, between September and November, Division of State Document staff and AELR committee staff um, from the Department of Legislative Services worked with agencies to create a temporary system of emailing regulations. In the um, 2022 interim report to the Legislative Policy Committee, the AELR committee noted that there was significant miscommunication and substantial delays during this time period. Um, though the agencies and ELF were able to gain access again in November, on November 18th. Exhibit 4 shows the difference in the number of emergency and non-emergency regulations that the AELR committee was able to receive um, in fiscal 20, or in calendar 2021 and 2022. Um, functionality issues, however, per, continue to persist. It was not until January 2023 that AELR committee council got its first notification from the new ELF system, for example, um, and agencies are continuing to have difficulties when submitting extension requests um, or if there's a non-emergency regulation effective date already in place. Other functionality issues have come up when agencies report that proposed regulations have no fiscal impact. Uh, a, the DLS had requested that the Division of State Documents um, provide a little more information about this process, um, which they did in their testimony. Um, so the office reports that um, the Division of State Documents do it and the company are working to create, working to create the new ELF had developed a list of, prioritized list of issues, um, but DLS is asking that the office comment on the ongoing issues in their um, testimony today. Uh, that wraps up my discussion of the budget change, and now I'll move on to the key observation sections of the analysis. Uh, with Exhibit 5, uh, this shows the charitable organizations registered and delinquent charities in the state. One of the office's duties is to regulate charitable organizations registered in Maryland. The number of registered charities shown in blue um, continued to increase in fiscal 22 to over 17,300. You'll also notice the number of delinquent charities as seen in the red bars um, rose in fiscal 22 to, approx to approximately 3,400. The delinquencies resolved in fiscal 21 and fiscal 22 are higher than in fiscal 2017 through 2020 or in the pre-pandemic period. Um, this graph also shows that contacts to charities regarding noncompliance have decreased. Uh, the office reports that the decreased enforcement actions taken in fiscal 21 and 22 were the result of, temporary, of a temporary shift in priorities towards processing. Um, charitable applications, and as well as by position vacancies. Um, DLS is asking that the office comment today on how the enforcement actions of the division have been impacted by the database replacement and how the agency resolved the related findings identified by the OLA audit. Exhibit 6 on page 10 shows the number of notary public commissions. There are about 91,000 notaries in the state, um, and their commissions are valid for a period of four years. The number of notary public commissions processed in fiscal 22 um, was 17,890, a 38.3% decrease from fiscal 21. However, the fiscal 21 number is inflated due to two reasons, so it shouldn't really be seen as a decrease. Um, firstly, the figure was inflated by or due to the extension of deadlines under the governor's declared state of emergency and catastrophic health emergency, um, notary public commission ex commissions did not expire for a window of time, so they didn't have to reapply. Um, and then the office has also been able to process commissions virtually for the first time um, in fiscal 21, may have also encouraged some applica applicants to get their commissions processed early. The final exhibit on page 11 shows participation trends in the Address Confidentiality Program, or ACP. 
originally intended to serve, to serve survivors of domestic abuse, the program has been expanded over time to include survivors of other crimes as well as to household members of an eligible applicant or program participant. The number of uh, participants statewide increased in fiscal 22 to almost uh, or to approximately 1,476 individuals. There were 13 new participants in fiscal 22 due to the expanded eligibility provided through Chapter 124 of 2021. Um, to conclude my presentation, DLS recommends that um, the subcommittee concur with the governor's allowance. Um, I'd ha be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Are there any questions from any members of the committee? Seeing none, just thank you as usual um, for a phenomenal job. And we'll have the agency report. I do not see Madam Secretary, but I do see uh, Deputy Secretary Michael Lohr and the team. Um, just want to first say congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Corey uh, McRae, um, uh, Senator Zucker, Senator Hedelman, uh, Senator Jennings. I, I don't want to call you by your first name in such a formal setting. Uh, sorry, I stumbled there. But uh, you have our written testimony and some of the responses. But let me just highlight that uh, Secretary Lee, of course, would love to be here. She's at a cabinet meeting. Uh, they're having a remote meeting. Otherwise, I'm sure she'd be here. She was a little torn because she'd. Uh, love to present before you today. Uh, we have um, a big portfolio, as you know, and as uh, Ms. Miller highlighted, there are a lot of duties beyond just her role as the uh, ambassador uh, for the state of Maryland. So uh, let's start with the Division of State Documents. Um, obviously, there's a lot that's been mentioned about the ELF system, and this is priority number one for us is to resolve this issue. We actually had a call this morning with the vendor and the AELR Council. So we're prioritizing uh, resolving that issue and we get into more details. And as was mentioned, uh, for the notaries uh, uh, public, there are 91,000 notaries. I know many of you um, sign off on the notary process and, and there are ways that you can actually defer that to the Secretary of State's office. If uh, your staff finds that more convenient, we're happy to talk to them about that process. Uh, that's something you would do at the beginning of the term. So just wanted to highlight that. Um, there, were, uh, uh, there was a law passed last year uh, for remote notary um, acts performed. Um, this was actually extended to um, uh, wills and estates uh, by request of the State Bar Association, uh, States and Trust Section. Um, and uh, the costs were increased, the maximum cost for notaries uh, from uh, $4 originally to $6. And then for remote um, notarizations from 4 to the maximum of 25 to help uh, pay for the costs of, of the technology that would be required for that. Um, we have uh, 18,000 charities that are registered and more that are regulated uh, by the state of Maryland. Uh, that number has grown significantly uh, over the past decade or so. Uh, there are 162 enforcement actions uh, for charities with delinquent registrations in FY22. We can get into more of that um, uh, later if that's uh, requested. The Maryland Charities Campaign you may be familiar with is the state's uh, state employee giving arm. Uh, proud to report that they were just about $18,000 shy of the, the goal, of about 99% of the $2 million goal. So we consider that an excess, a success in an election year. So very proud of that accomplishment. Uh, there is an astounding 442 extraditions that are also processed by the agency. And uh, that is uh, actually done by one individual right now. Um, but um, we do concur with the governor's budget. Um, there are some things to note um, with the ACP program. They have uh, 1,544 active participants, and they shield, at this point, 69 deeds. I know Secretary Lee is uh, particularly proud of that because she sponsored the legislation to allow that to occur. So these are uh, victims of intimate partner violence or uh, sex trafficking, and there are uh, over 700 uh, uh, what are called certified application assistants. So, um, these are people that would help with the processing of those applications. Uh, the, the eligibility has been expanded, as was noted, to those individuals who are threatened. Uh, the numbers, I think there were seven indivi individuals now that have qualified under that new threshold. We expect that to increase perhaps in the next few years. Uh, but again, uh, we do concur with the governor's allowance, and we can answer some of the questions. You have our uh, written response to the um, uh, questions that were provided by Ms. Miller. 
and happy to get into any of those specifically, but I, I would highlight uh, certainly with uh, DSD and, and Gail's here to present that and, and before I get too far ahead of myself and I'm finished We have our assistant secretaries here um, Miss Smith and uh, mr. Smalls who can get into any details of uh, questions you may have since this is my first week and uh, it's it's been uh, It's been very educational. We, we actually had our first head of state meeting with the uh, president of Bosnia Herzegovina um, uh, Beatrovich president Beatrovich um, interesting government they have three presidents so you think our government's uh, complicated uh, so uh, it, it, we met in the silver room and secretary Lee was proud to represent the state of Maryland and she's just really honored to be in this role and, and so am I to be her deputy so thank you uh, Senator Hedelman I, I do have a question and you please feel free to defer to anybody but what happens um, the, I was surprised at some of the data about the charitable um, organizations. What happens? What what is sort of the process for any sort of enforcement mechanism to get them to comply? Thank you so much for your question, Senator. This is Kathy Smith. Uh, so our charities are notified when they are delinquent. So they get um, confirmation by email or regular U.S. mail and phone calls identifying what the delinquent aspects are and inviting them, asking them to uh, provide the documentation that's necessary. So we really work with them initially as a soft touch to help. We want them to be compliant, to help them to do that in every way we can. And then certainly that graduates into more uh, substantial actions as necessary. And what, what are, could you tell us what those so are? So we, you know, theor and we have our assistant AG with us too who may be able to get into some of the legal aspects of what happens there. But uh, frankly, we could suspend them if, if we needed to do that. But again, our goal is to help them succeed. Thank you. Of course. Senator Jennings. Thank you. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Secretary. New term to call you. Uh, and this is, I'm not necessarily looking for an answer now. You can kind of come back to me. Having, you know, just taken over the agency, you guys are there. You know, my big issue is making sure that we are, uh, our IT systems are hardened, especially with the secretary's past with legislation. She's worked hard in the cyber. I just, when you get a chance, let me know, you know, after you guys have been there for a little while. And, you know, the other secretaries might have answers for this now, but how do you feel your systems are? Do you feel that they are adequate? Um, Harden for today's cybersecurity requirements, especially with the the shielding services you provide, making sure there's no hacks, there's no breaches. Um, well, I, I can provide a quick answer, and I'm sure I'll have more nuance as I can get more um, accustomed to the role. But based on my past uh, familiarity with the address confidentiality program, they actually have physical files, so it's it's not something that actually is even connected to the internet. And everything that is internal is, is again just is separate and we are now actually moving the location of the office to be more secure so physically secure so um, it would be hard to breach that in okay. a cyber attack uh, for the other systems uh, part of the problem actually with the elf system that originated this was chip Stewart and others wanted to uh, move off of the 2003 servers which were vulnerable because they were not um, there, there were no more patches for that server therefore they wanted to move off of that server and some of that actually might have created the uh, rush to move to this new system and uh, but because they are on a new system with the new server we can update those patches so it's much less likely to be uh, affected by a cyber breach okay. thank you Seeing so, you no know, further questions from the committee, could you please send out our regards over to our new uh, Secretary of State? And um, thank you for you all's uh, service to our great state of Maryland. Thank you again, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Colleagues, at this time, we're going to bring up our last agency, which is the State Archives. And we have analyst Jacob Polakov. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, for both the introduction and the microphone. Uh, I'm here today to present the analysis of the State Archives. 
do a quick overview of the program first. The State Archives is Maryland's central depository for government records of permanent value. The State Archives retains information from all three branches of the state government, and it is one of the largest state archival organizations in the nation. Holdings kept in the State Archives date from the state's founding in 1634 and include key documents, including Maryland's executive, legislative, and judicial records from both the colonial and state eras. The State Archives also maintains custodianship over more than 3,500 paintings of value and other works of art owned by or loaned to the state and provides for the acquisition, preservation, and proper care of these items. These endeavors cover more than 400,000 cubic feet of materials, and the State Archives provides access to key public records online and in person at their headquarters in Annapolis. And I visited. It's a lovely facility. Oops. Uh, so we're going to look at just the overall growth real quick of the fiscal 2024 budget, which increases $932,402, uh, or about 9.5% to $10.8 million. Um, and as I said, that's uh, change is illustrated here in Exhibit 1. Uh, and Exhibit 1 on page 2 uh, shows that the majority of the State Archives budget is spent on personnel. That's 70%. Other significant categories in the budget include fixed charges uh, at 10% and contractual services at 9%, with additional and replacement equipment for the Archives operations following up at 8%, and then assorted other expenses making up the remainder. This year's budget change, uh, as mentioned, is about $932,000. Uh, the largest changes in this budget come from increases in employee and retiree health insurance, as well as annualization of November 2022's 4.5% cost of living adjustment, uh, as well as some new positions that the Archives is adding this year. Other changes include computer and IT equipment upgrades, as well as an increase in contractual services for archival activities and uh, costs for electricity and system software maintenance. In fiscal 2024, the allowance is for 70.8 positions for the archives, um, which is an increase uh, from last year of one position. Um, there are currently seven vacancies, which have been, uh, which are, pardon me, there are currently seven vacancies, three of which have been unfilled uh, since on or before December the 31st, 2021. Uh, I'm told that there is progress in filling these, but I'll leave that for the State Archives to comment on. And in 2024, the State Archives receives one additional trainee position in the allowance assigned to the Criminal Research Department. Move over to key observations, and this is page five. Uh, throughout each fiscal year, the State Archives makes determinations on whether certain local and state records are of permanent value. These items include government and citizen records, artwork, and historical papers. The agency collects and maintains these records and other items on behalf of the state. Since fiscal 2018, the number of items in the fiscal and electronic collections has grown by 3.3% and 5.5%, that's respectively. Uh, the current items, as previously mentioned, comprise over 400,000 cubic feet of materials, along with more than 167,000 gigabytes of electronic data. Exhibit 3 shows the growth of the physical and electronic data from 2018 uh, through the estimates for fiscal 2023. The blue bars represent the collections material in cubic feet, and the red bars are electronic data in gigabytes. The Maryland Manual Online has continued to grow this year, uh, as it does every year. Uh, the Maryland Manual Online provides a comprehensive guide to government uh, and resources available through the state. The manual includes items related to each branch of government, as well as services and assistance available to the public. The manual also provides information on taxes, state laws, and the Code of Maryland regulations. The State Archives updates the Man Maryland Manual online on a daily basis and regularly creates, edits, and uploads new files and graphics to expand the manual. Exhibit 5, which is on page 7, shows the number of files and graphics created and maintained as part of the manual, uh, and that's grown by nearly 5,000 items, a 27% increase since fiscal 2018.
Every year, the State Archives offers a number of public programs, and they do so both in person and virtually. Um, this number was impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but the ability to host virtual programs did compensate for the loss of in-person programming. Um, pardon me. Um, the, uh, as I said, the number of programs uh, was impacted by COVID-19, and without data that displays the number of attendees of both types of programs, virtual and in-person separately, it is difficult to ascertain whether or not virtual events and in-person events have similar numbers of attendees or if one is more effective than the other in reaching participants. State archives should comment on if attendance data is kept for programs offered and if there is a set of best practices that the agency is following to determine an effective balance of in-person and virtual events that maximizes public accessibility and attendance. And then uh, the recommendation is that the subcommittee concur with the governor's allowance for fiscal 2024. Thank you, Mr. Polikov. Um, just want to check and see if there are any questions from any members of the committee. Seeing none at this time, I'd like to bring up our state archivist, uh, Ms. Bachman, and her team. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. I am, and members of the subcommittee, I am Elaine Rice Bachman, your state archivist. It is my honor to represent all of the staff of the state archives today, and I have with me my leadership team, Emily Olin Squires and Corey Lewis who between them have decades of service uh, to the agency and individual skills and leadership in their respective areas of research and reference, digitization, imaging, and electronic archiving. It is my pleasure to appoint them both as assistant state archivists in October. Also here today, I want to acknowledge and thank our Director of Administration, Teresa Fawley, and her Deputy John Talon, as well as Liz Coelho, who serves as the archives legislative liaison. I want to thank Jacob Polico for his analysis, thank him for coming to the archives and getting to know our operations, and thank him for his recommendation. I will refer you to my written testimony for a more full response to our budget, but in the meantime, I just want to say to you all um, how grateful we are for the governor's allowance. Um, the significant increase to our IT is going to allow us to replace electronic equipment that makes our records safe and accessible. Um, it's essential that that happen. I'm sure you're not surprised that we have an ever-growing electronic archive, but at pace with that, we are digitizing our paper records to make them more accessible. So all of that requires equipment, it requires updated equipment, and certainly the cybersecurity issue is um, foremost as well. Um, this is really going to help us meet the growing public demand for access to records. Uh, people who want to not have to come into our agency and access those at home, so we are constantly seeking to digitize our paper records as well. I also want to thank the, uh, the Governor's Allowance and the General Assembly for a generally funded PIN position to support our federally mandated three to five day turnaround for FBI NICS requests. That is to be in compliance with the Brady Act. Having a position specifically for that where we have only had one person doing that has meant that we've constantly sort of had to call people off of other core mission duties in order to meet that requirement. So we're very grateful for that. We've had a modest increase across several accounts that more accurately reflect our expenses. So my initial thought in testifying was just to come here and say thank you and, and drop the mic. But, but Jacob uh, has brought up a point of our um, wanting us to comment on our public programs. We're very happy to do that. Like all um, cultural institutions, really all institutions, we pivoted to virtual programming in addition to our in-person programming as we have been able to bring in-person programming back. So we do track our attendance. Um, Emily just was giving me an updated figure today that on average we have 96 people on, uh, attending each of our public events. Some of those we tailor to the virtual world. We have a really wonderful lunch and learn program with the Enoch Pratt Library where we are doing virtual lectures, we are literally reaching an international audience and an audience that can continue to watch that over and over as it is recorded. Then we tailor small in-person programs as needed to help people with our records. So those are, by design, very small programs. Um, but we are always looking to ways to increase our audience, and as, as I mentioned, we have an increasing demand from the public for access. 
We're looking forward to our annual opportunity to support the Senate President and the Senate with the uh, President's Day ceremony in the old Senate chamber and also the presentation of the First Citizen Awards in March. And with that, um, I want to direct you to our annual report for any additional information about our agency and welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. Just a couple questions. With the uh, positions that have been empty longer than a year, how many are there at this moment that we sit in? That are, we're actively recruiting, and I'll defer to Teresa, three of those. That is correct. Actively recruiting three. Um, others are in development to either be reclassed to support another operation um, as we've had retirements and been able to sort of re refocus our, our efforts and operations. We've had a couple of unsuccessful recruitments, unfortunately. I'm sure that echoes other state agencies. It's hard to compete uh, when there's a long, slow process, so we're having to sort of go back to, to repost um, in two of those cases. If you could just supply the committee with what those three um, uh, positions are within your respective agency, that would be helpful. When you talked about the 100-plus programs that exist um, that you do throughout the state. Could you speak to, like, obviously it's Black History Month. Speak to, like, example of three programs that you have going on this month. Emily, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, actually, uh, next week we will have our monthly Lunch and Learn program. That will be a um, virtual program that is in partnership with the Enoch Pratt Library. So it will be online and it will be recorded and then put on our past presentations page. That program is being presented by Janice Hayes Williams, who will be presenting the history of the Crownsville um, Cemetery and the Crownsville Hospital and the new memorial that will be going up. So that's the first public program. Um, also, we have staff that are supporting local colleges and communities. So also next week, we have a program with um, Julie King, Dr. Julie King and St. Mary's College. She is bringing a group of students here and we are doing a co-talk class with them on the history of the archeology span of the property at St. Mary's College. Um, and then, I guess last but not least, I would say part of our programming is supporting the Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We uh, run the website for that commission, and we help uh, hybrid host the public meetings so the public can listen and participate in those meetings. They have monthly meetings as well at, of the full commission, as well as three subcommittees each month meet, and we provide the hybrid access to those. So those are just things that are coming up within the next couple of weeks. Yes, ma'am. And Ms. Bachman, if you could, if you could supply the committee with a list of the 100 plus programs. I'm, this, I'm new to this committee, so I was trying to educate myself. I read the one before this, but like I kept thinking, like, what are these 100 plus programs? That no, great. We'll be glad to, to provide you. And I can I add a fourth? Um, the Commission on Artistic Property, which is within a part of our um, our agency, and I'm the secretary of the State House Trust. We've just placed throughout the complex, including in the Senate and the House Building, and in the State House and the Archives Room, an exhibition in partnership with. Steve Stevenson University on blacks in the military mm. throughout history. So I encourage you to read those panels. Nice. Um, my last question is deal with this beautiful painting that we have of Thurgood Marshall hanging right in JPR. Did, did your agency, like, were you all over, have oversight of that? Not oversight. We were partners in the Curatorial Commission, and the fundraising that Senator Smith so generously led came through the Friends of the Maryland State Archives. So we had a vehicle to accept those as tax uh, deductible donations. And then because it was becoming a part of the state-owned art collection, our chief curator, Catherine Arthur, and myself served on the committee with Senator Smith and um, with the team, with Ernest and his uh, team as well. So we, we were part of the process from, from the beginning, and now we have sected it into the state's art collection, and we're thrilled to have that initiative, and I've said this in my remarks at the opening, at the dedication of the painting, you know, we so often are coming to the General Assembly appealing for funds to support the art collection. <laughs> to have Gener Senator Smith take that initiative and say, I want to make this change, I want to have diversify the collection, I want to have a black artist, to have him do the heavy lift of the fundraising for that, it was just so gratifying, and I, it really gives me hope for the future of the, of the art collection. Nice. 
Now, I read an article in the Afro, I want to say, this past week, and um, it talked about there was a first version of this painting. And if you could just help me understand, like, what's the process in reference to, I guess, when you're uh, commissioning a painting and one version may not be accepted versus another I'm version. happy to, and I really want to credit Mr. Shaw with his um, flexibility in working with the committee. Senator Smith, from the beginning, we had a process laid out where we would see some sketches as we went through the process. Senator Smith really had a vision that this image of Marshall would be one of, of a young Marshall related to his time in the early cases of the NAACP and, and specifically the case related to Donald Gaines Murray um, integrating the, the Maryland School of Law. So we wanted a young marshal. The archives provided some photos for Mr. Shaw to use. And the first version that we saw was really further along than mm -hmm. we anticipated. And so um, it was an older marshal, and it was just, it didn't quite meet the vision that Mr. Smith had. And, and we really appreciate that, that Ernest went back and, and came up with the ver another version and worked very closely with Larry Gibson, who, who knew yeah. Thurgood Marshall and who could really provide a backstory to a particular photograph that was always believed to have been taken on the day that the Donald Gaines Murray mm -hmm. um, decision came down. It was, Murray v. it was Murray v. Pearson. And it was actually, because Larry knew this, it was a staged photo at the Afro, mm -hmm. in the offices of the Afro. So Charles Houston, Thurgood Marshall, and Donald Gaines Murray, you know, they win the case in their excitement. You know, they hadn't had a photograph taken. Mm -hmm. So they sort of reposed this as if they're in trial photo at the Afro. And Larry, when he provided that context for Ernest, I mean, I think it really just, um, it was inspiring in so many ways. And so that image of Marshall that we have now outside judicial proceedings. It's literally that, that you know, we say it, that, that hungry Marshall, that young guy who was out there fighting these cases. You know, he hadn't quite grown into this giant mm -hmm. that we often see depicted in art and sculpture. And, and that was really the image that, that, that Senator Smith was seeking and that Ernest so, so beautifully captured. Yep. No, thank you for uh, helping me to understand that, and just thank you for lifting up Professor Gibson. Um, that's all my questions. I'm going to send it over to Senator Jennings. Uh, my question was on the digital data storage. I'm pretty sure it's big files, terabytes, petabytes, I don't know how big it is. And you talk about moving it. Are you guys storing it? Do you have your own servers? Or are you in the cloud now? I'll ask Corey to address that. Okay. Sure. Um, we're storing it ourselves. We, we don't have cloud storage. And when we are moving it, this was an upgrade to our system. So uh, the actual database numbers, I believe, uh, reduced slightly. Uh, but this is our, our own service, yes. And you've got redundancy backups? And yes, uh, very much so. Redundancy backups for uh, all of our, our, our images, all, all of our platforms. Yes, Split. all site, okay. as well as at our, our rolling run facility, which is in Woodlawn. Okay. I just, I know everybody in government is moving towards the cloud, and I just was curious, you know, why we're hosting and not pushing to the cloud. Well, I, th I think in some reasons also we're a victim of our own success. We've been digitizing records for over 24 years. It's not just uh, our own collections. It's uh, MD Landrec, Plast.net. I believe we have over 321 uh, million images uh, accessible online. Um, and that sheer magnitude of images, having them in a cloud environment uh, within our own uh, agency, we've decided that's maybe not the best policy to go with. So we are hosting our own servers. And okay. we do have a robust IT department that is very hands-on. Okay. Thank you. Senator Haldeman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, and thank you for your explanation of the portrait um, it, and for your panels. I've seen them um, throughout the complex here, and I look forward to exploring them more, and um, love that you did it in partnership with Stevenson University, a wonderful institution in my district. So thank you for that. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned something about being compliant with Brady, Federal Brady Act. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The Brady... Um, Gun Safety Act requires that NICS requests the National Instant, I have to always look at my but, acronyms, right. National Instant Criminal Background Check okay. System, yep. that those be responded to within three to five days. So when we get a request for a background check, sometimes that can take up to, you know, I think the average is three to five hours of research for each one of those. If those start to back up, as they tend to do, um, we have to be compliant with getting the response to the FBI within three to five days, and that sometimes requires pulling other staff off to do that research. So, I'm sorry, at, at the front end, how are you involved in that process at all? Oh, go ahead. Who, <laughs> would you like to go? Oh, yeah, I can. <laughs> 
please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we get the requests from the law enforcement agencies, from the FBI, because we hold the court records. The Maryland State Archives holds the court records. So our staff has to search court indices for a background check of the individuals. You so you hold court records for past a certain period of time? Yes. Or, yeah. Yes. <laughs> what, what's that time period? Um, I think we have court records as recent as the, like, 2015? Yeah, 20, I mean, very years. recent. Oh, okay. Oh, I had no idea. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Interesting. Thank you, Senator Hedelman. And seeing no further questions, just want to thank you, Ms. Bachman, our state archivist, uh, for the work that you do across the state of Maryland. Look forward to further discussion and some of the uh, uh, responses that should be submitted. And Ms. Squires and Mr. Lewis, just want to say um, it was great to meet you both, but most importantly, congratulations on the uh, matriculation through the um, uh, uh, job piece of it. Y'all have a blessed day. Um, colleagues, uh, and obviously Mr. Polakov, just thank you for your leadership and what you do for, uh, with the analyst report and helping us navigate our way through it. Colleagues, this ends our hearings today, this Friday. Um, hope you all have a blessed weekend. Thank, thank you. you very much.